What's going on, Real Life fam? We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship with you today. We're also excited because we know that all it takes is one encounter with God to change your whole life. And we believe that that day could be today. We would love it if you share this experience by clicking the share button or copy the link and send it to a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected to your Real Life family. Well, it's about that time to get started. Thanks again for joining us. Hey, good morning. Good to see everyone. Want to welcome our campuses. We love you guys, everybody online. It's a new year. It's a new year. We're kicking off a new series. You just saw it. It's called Foundations, Habits to Build a Strong Faith. And we need this because while it's a new year, it's also January 15th. So you know what that means, right? Most of you have already fallen off whatever wagon you put yourself on two weeks ago. If your gym was crowded last week, go this week because it'll be empty. It's usually about three weeks is how long a resolution lasts. We won't do a show of hands. ain't trying to shame anybody, but we usually, a friend of mine that we're actually in a a, a weight loss accountability thing together, another pastor friend, uh, he, he had to confess this morning. He texted me, he goes, I am so bloated. I ate so much food last night, and I was just like, that's just the conviction of God in your life. Like, you know, confession will heal you, brother. Let's go. Because I stopped eating at 3 o'clock, and I'm still hungry right now. I might pass out, but we have people ready to go. So anyway, we usually fall off that wagon by now, and, and the thing is because big resolutions don't work. Have you noticed that? You know what? Here's what works. Small change over time. Consistency brings progress. And really, the truth about our lives is most of us today, right now, we are a product of the disciplines and decisions that we've been making over time. And that's how we ended up here, good or bad. Here's what I love about God. I love a lot of things about about God, but here's one that I really love. God offers change. And not just that fake change that we all want to bring about in ourselves, but he offers real change, significant change, transformational change. And not only does God make change possible through his spirit, but he makes it accessible to everyone. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. He says, uh, first of all, who is this promise for? Uh, the smart people who are in Christ. The good people who are in Christ. The very religious church people. He says, anyone who's in Christ. It's for everybody. Change is possible, and it's highly accessible. Anyone that moves in into Christ can be a new creation. That's a cool promise. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know what you do for a living. Jesus is in the changed lives business. That's what he does, and he doesn't just start it but he finishes it. He keeps going. And so everybody here, whether this is day one on your Jesus journey, or you've been doing it for a long time like me, either way, you can, you, there's more and you can be a new creation in Christ. You can be fuller, freer. You can be newer, better. And that's what he wants for your life. There, I really believe this is true. I've been doing this a long time and I believe the best is yet to come for me, for you, for us, As a church, there's so much more that God has for us. There's so much that he wants to do in us and through us. All right, another thing I love about God, because this is important, he accepts us right where we are. Isn't that nice? Right? So change is possible, it's accessible to everyone, and you don't have to start from a place you're not at. God accepts us right where we are. And here's what's really cool about God, because while he accepts us and takes us as we are, he loves us way too much to leave us like this. 
Thank you, Lord. I'll take you just like that. So whatever you're giving to God, whatever you're bringing today, whatever you're offering to him, you're like, this ain't much, but if you say you want it, you know, he'll take it. He takes us as we are. He loves us too much to leave us like that. And so he keeps working, the Bible says, until completion, until new creation. That's his vision for our lives. And in Ephesians chapter two, it says this, for we are God's handiwork. In the Greek, it's the word poema, and it translates work of art. So that's why we say handiwork, but we're literally, he says we're God's work of art, and we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, and God prepared in advance for us to do these things, but we're his work of art. Listen, God wants to show off in and through your life. He doesn't want to just show up and help you. He actually wants to show off to the world through you, because your life is a reflection of his love. He... Here, I'll give you an example, because this is, this is really cool. Big week at the Miller House, okay? Big week at the Miller House. First of all, son number two graduated college. Doing good. We're doing good, mama. We're getting there. Son number two graduated. There's this feeling of like, okay, okay, we're doing pretty good, especially to still be in my early 30s and to have all this, all this. Dang, y'all didn't even laugh. That was like, boo, throwing Bibles. Calm down. It's calm. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting old. I know these stories like this, you know you're getting old because here's the real kicker. My oldest son, Noah, got engaged this week. So cool. Some of you already knew. I put it on Instagram. Robin put it on Facebook because we are so excited. He got engaged to this beautiful girl, Erica. She is the sweetest thing. We couldn't be happier. I don't know. Sometimes if your kids get engaged, you might be like, gulp, who knows where this is going. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. We got a, we got a winner and we are so proud. Here's something too. I don't know if you saw it in the picture, but she kind of had featured her finger just a little bit. We had to coach her because it's just like slide it up there like, bam, I got my man, but I also got my ring, right? That's really important. We wanted to see that ring because here's the thing. If you know Noah, my guy Noah is thrifty. Let's put it that way. Okay. We're going to say thrifty. My guy Noah, our, our oldest son is so cheap. He would make Dave Ramsey blush. He does not spend money. I'm telling you, this is an actual true story that just two weeks ago, I, I had to give him a hand-me-down pair of shoes. Y'all know I got shoes, right? So I'm like, but he and I are the same size. So I'm like, take some shoes, take some shoes. He's like, I don't want any shoes, dad. You already gave me shoes. I said, that was five years ago. My dude finally wore out his shoes for five years and he took a new free pair of shoes from his dad, hand-me-downs. And so now he's got another five years. He's pretty excited, you know? New shoes, new wife. I mean, it's going to be a good year for Noah. But as cheap as Noah is, here's why I'm so proud. Because my dude went in on that ring. And he didn't ask me what I thought. I don't think, did he run anything by you about like, uh, because Robin probably would have told him, don't, you know, I don't know what you would have told him, but like, she's pretty thrifty too. I think that's where he gets it. (laughs) My dude went in. And so he comes over to the house. We open the box and I'm like, what? I did not expect it, you know, because I I wear a rubber ring. By the way, mine broke recently, so I'm waiting for Amazon to send me another rubber ring. You know, these things are really important to us. The marriage, very important. The ring, it's like I'm on my sixth rubber ring because I lost so many surfing that I was like, I am not spending that much money on ring replacements. I didn't expect him to go in on the ring like this. It was so beautiful, and I was so proud of him. And as we were talking about it, he goes, I know I don't spend a lot of money. He goes, but Erica's worth it. Yes, like you get it, boy, you get it. Yes, that ring, because that that ring, listen, is a reflection of Noah's love. It reflects her and her value, but it also reflects his love for her. Our lives are a reflection of his love. And you think about what God's done for us. Just like Noah put that ring on Erica's finger, the Lord has given us his one and only son. He's put his spirit in us to live in us. He wants our lives to be a glorious reflection of, of his love to, to show the world, this is who I am and this is what I can do. And you know, like he doesn't want us just believe in the story and going to church. That's not God's goal. A lot of times that's where we end up in our culture. He's like, no, I, I literally want to take your jacked up, broke down, busted up old life. And I want to turn it into something new, a new creation. And that's why God is always working. He takes Joy as, uh, or sorrow, and he turns it into joy. You mentioned that, Pastor Mark. It's so true. He gives us beauty for ashes. 
He turns uh, bad into good. The Bible said he's always working to do that because he wants people to look at our lives and say, wow, how is that even possible? It, wow. You mean you're saying that God can love a guy like Justin? Like there's hope for me. You know, if, if he can change his life, maybe there's hope for me. And this is the way, by the way, this is the greatest Christian in history. This is how he described it. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, here's a trustworthy saying. You can take this to the bank. Deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason... I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. You see the plan? I mean, God is 100% taking you as you are, but he also loves you way too much to leave you that way. And so for your good and for his glory, he is making you a new creation in Christ because your life is a reflection of his love. And so what I want to do in this series, why this series is so important, I'm just laying the foundation for it, is because I want to give you tools, tips, techniques, basically hacks. I will tell you this, okay? I'm a slacker. And so when I think about this, why, God, why would you use a slacker like me to lead a church? Because I think it's like, it's like those Geico commercials, so easy a caveman can do it. That's my testimony, okay? The Lord's like, so easy, even Pastor Jay can do it. And so when I realize of all the things God's used to develop my life, that the one thing that it all starts with, the beauty, the blessing, the better that he has had for me, it started with his word. That fuller, freer, newer life, it always starts with the word of God. And so I want to do something different, because if I say it, it's like, well, he has to say that. He's the preacher. Right? If I tell you, you should read the Bible, you're like, mm, that's your job. Okay, check this out. I'm going to ask you guys at all the locations, all right, here's what I want to do. If, and no judgment, no judgment, all right? Nobody gets points for anything either. There's not like a free t-shirt for the one who does it the most. I just want you guys to be honest. God is watching. The only thing he cares about is that you're honest. Don't brag. All right. How many of you would say that you read the Bible regularly, like daily-ish, Like, we got some Bible readers, and it's totally okay if if you're not raising your hand right now, because that's what this message is about. Okay, all right, cool. You saw, hold on, you got to keep them up for a second. I'm just checking to see if our pastors are, okay, good, Pastor Mark. (laughs) I mean, right? (laughs) Okay, okay. So, all right, I'm going to ask you another question, because this this isn't about me just telling you. I I want you guys to see this play out. Uh, For those of you who read the Bible regularly, How many of you would recommend the book? You say it's really beneficial to your life. Raise your hand and keep them up for a second. These are the people who read the Bible regularly. They're all saying that, yes, it's beneficial at all our locations. Keep them up for a second. How many of you would say that the Bible has made a significant impact on your life, reading it on a regular? You can put it down if it's not true. Okay. All right. Okay. There, that, actually, more hands are going up, and that's not even the game. Okay, so how many of you who are holding your hands up, you read the Bible on a regular basis, keep them up, would say that the Bible has changed your life? Yeah, amen. Act- I don't see any going down. That, do you see what I'm saying? Because And here's why this is important. Thank you guys for participating. Oh, yeah, you're, you guys are so obedient. I love y'all. <laughs> like, until he says, until he says, this hand is up. <laughs> I have two in the whole church like you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this, this is so interesting to me because everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Isn't that true? You meet people, you talk to people. If you're like, hey, you should come to church. You know, oh, you believe all that stuff? And it's like, well, yeah. Well, um, well I just think the Bible is... You, have you had these conversations, or is it just me? Every time I go somewhere, people want to pick a fight with me about the Bible. Oh, well, you know, everybody has an opinion about the Bible. It's a, it's a historical book, and I just believe, you know, men wrote it over time, and I just don't think that it's really as accurate as, and all these people have opinions about the Bible. What you just saw is the people who actually read it don't have an opinion. They have a testimony. And I'll tell you what beats an opinion every time is a testimony. It's somebody who says, man, I don't just believe something about it. I actually know because I've read it, and it's changed my life. I've tested it, and I've seen that it's true. 
I, I want to read something else to you. Second Timothy. Now, this is the same guy. I'm going to read a few things to you that the Bible says about itself, essentially. These are what people in the Bible that were recorded for us say. And this is Paul writing to a younger man that would be a pastor. Second Timothy 3, this is to Timothy. He says, you know how from infancy, you were little, you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12. I love this one. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. If you've been in it for a while, then you know. It's like the Bible didn't change, but somehow what it did in and through me changed over time. As I learned more, it grew more in my life. It's, it's alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It's a sword. That's an interesting thing. It cuts through the stuff, okay, that everybody wants to put out there. He says, no, the word will get right in there and get right to it. James testifies this in James chapter one. He says, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's a blessing. In Matthew chapter four, uh, Jesus is actually being tested by the devil. He says, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Psalm 119. It's actually the longest chapter in the Bible. Did you know that? Right in the middle of our Bible. Very interesting. The longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119, is a testimony of the Bible itself. And it's written, each stanza starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And then the stanza itself is highlighted with that letter. It's brilliant and poetic. We lose it in the English. But in Psalm 119, 105, it says this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. In a dark world, don't you think a light would help? He says that's what it is. Uh, this question in Psalm 119.9, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? It's a great question. Here's the answer. He says, by living according to your word. I could do this all day long. I could read you all these great scriptures that testify, but, but the truth is if you want to live a life that reflects the love that God has for you, it starts with his word. Amen. And if you listen, if you think about all the benefits and the blessings that we just read, okay, all the things that the Bible says that it can do, if I had a product that could do all those things and I told you that I would sell it to you, right? If I told you I had a product that would light your path, you ever felt like I don't know which way to go and said, oh, this thing's a light, it'll illuminate your path, it'll show you which way to go, you'd be like, okay, I'm interested, keep talking, it'll keep you pure, because you're like, man, I just want to stay, I want to stay on, on the straight and narrow. I want that pure. It'll keep you pure. It'll give you freedom. It'll give you blessing. Like James says, it'll keep you growing. It'll make you wise. It will equip you for everything you face in life. If I had a product that I could sell you right now that did all those things, you'd buy it. Listen, you know how I know? I sold knives in college, okay? And my parents bought some, and they're still happy they did. They're good knives. <laughs> but I was terrible at selling knives. But I want to tell you, if I had a product and I was telling you, all you would have to do, even those of you who are broke would buy it. You'd be like, Pastor, listen, man, I get paid next Friday. I'm going to let you hold my electric lawnmower for a minute. All right, as a down payment, because I got to get me some of that. I got to have that thing. Hook me up. The crazy thing is God gives his book away for free. He gives it. It's available everywhere to everyone all the time. Online, it's free. On the apps, it's free. At any church, you can steal one, and they won't prosecute. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it. I snatched a few Bibles over my time, and they, they just look at you, and they're like, all right, fine. You know, you walk out of here with pens, they might shake you down, but the Bible, they're going to let you have it. <laughs> you can ask any Christian, hey, man, I don't have a Bible. They'll buy you one, and if they can't afford it, they'll find you a Christian who can. The, the Word of God is available to everyone, everywhere, all the time. And the question isn't, will it change your life? The question is, will you read it and let it change your life? Because it will. 
I know for me, I was nine years old when I went to church for the first time, which is kind of crazy. I, I missed out on a whole lot there, but uh, my parents were finding themselves. Anyway, long story. So we show up to church. I'm nine years old. I hear the gospel for the first time. 1982, guess what? It was this actual church, not this building, but this church. And you were there. You were there. Uh-huh. I'm looking around. I think maybe a couple people over there I saw earlier. There's about four of us, okay, and that are still here. But I go to this church in 1982, hear the gospel, get baptized. And the first thing I did, because this is what they told you to do. If you're going to be a Christian, how are you going to do it? I'm going to read the Bible. And so they, I got a Bible. It was, listen, listen, listen. It was this actual Bible. This is my actual children's Bible. Justin, it was presented to Justin Miller. That's me. By mom and dad on October 13th, 1982. Right there. I started reading this thing. It's like a living Bible for kids. It had a couple pictures. And there's one right there. I'm like, yo, what's with this fish eating this dude? I'm like, I didn't know nothing about that. This, it was all new to me. I'm, I'm like, giants? Y'all didn't tell me about the giants and the little people killing them with stones and stuff. I'm like, this is actually interesting. Not a big fan of school, but Sunday school. I'm like, let's go. Flannel graph. I was learning all kinds of stuff. I love my mom. She, I was so interested in the Bible. Then they enrolled me in our academy. It was the first year our church had an academy. And I think we're in our 50th year. We just celebrated our 40th year. 40th year. Because I'm 30. Anyway, I'm trying to do the math on stage. It's embarrassing. Yo, we just celebrated our 40th year as an academy, and our enrollment is at, is at an all-time high record enrollment. I guess there's some things going on in the educational system. Anyway, I learned the Bible in our academy. We're still teaching the Bible at Real Life Christian Academy today to all these kids. It's so cool. Then uh, what was really neat, so my testimony after that, read, I read this whole Bible, y'all. I still have the check marks next to the books of the Bible. When I would read them, I would check them off. I'd ask questions about them. And then I became a teenager, and what was cool is I didn't need the Bible anymore because I knew everything. None of you did this, but I did, okay? I became a teenager, and I didn't need this because I knew everything, and I already had everything figured out, and I didn't want to live how God told me. I want to live how I wanted to, and so totally wrecked my life. We'll make that story short. You know what brought me back? This Bible. I might get emotional on this one because I was a young adult and I had done a whole lot of things to pretty much ruin it, you know, and I remember having that prayer time with God and it was like his spirit was just, I just said, hey, you got to give me a life because I've, I've ruined mine and I was face down in the dirt and I remember him just kind of like there was this sense of I love you and I have more for you and I knew in my spirit, I just got to start reading this again. And uh, this was the Bible, you know, it's falling apart. I, I opened it up. It was kind of funny too, because I found that it was presented to Justin Miller by Justin Miller. I, I was at that season of life. You got to go get your own Bible. Okay. <laughs> but this thing's falling apart so many different ways. And I was skimming through it and I saw the notes that I had written to myself. It's a study Bible. And uh, God would just speak to me through this thing. And I was still, I mean, I was still living pretty wild. And I was in a, a band and I was playing in bars with my buddies. And after shows, I would want to get everybody together and tell them about what I was learning in the Bible. And I was like, guys, you won't believe this. You know what I was reading in the Bible? And they're like, no. And that's weird that you would ask. Like, what is wrong with you? We lost like our dude. We, we lost the ringleader. What is happening? I'm like, no, no, no. I'm still with you guys. I'm just telling you everything we're dealing with. God already wrote about it. And it kind of blows my mind. And I had a full circle moment recently because a couple weeks ago, I got in touch with um, the lead singer from my college bar band. And he's still in town. He's going through some really hard things. And uh, reached out. We connected. And he said this to me. It was on the phone. It was so powerful. But he said, hey, man, listen, okay, you remember how when you started reading the Bible, I called you like a Bible-thumping weirdo? I was like, yeah, vaguely. I don't remember the exact phraseology, but that sounds about right. You know, he said, you remember when you started working in that church? I was like, that's going to ruin your life. Those people are going to mess you up, bro. You are going down a dark path. I'm like, you know, when you start going to church and people are like, that's just bad. You're I'm like, no, I was already on a dark path. 
he, he said, you remember how I kind of ridiculed you and we were all making fun of you? I'm like, yeah, I kind of remember that. He goes, I was wrong. He goes, and I look at your life now, and he said, I'm proud of you, man. You proved me wrong. You made some good choices, and it shows. And it's, he said, not just for your life, but I talk to people all the time in this town whose life has been changed because you made that choice. He says, so thanks for proving me wrong. It was pretty powerful. I'm, yeah. I, to be old enough <laughs> to finally have some of your haters be like, good job. Prove me wrong. You know, it's kind of cool. And it reminded me, though, of what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 24. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The life God has for you, it starts with the word God wrote for you. The life that God has for you starts with the word God wrote for you. And he said, what he wanted to say, and he also said what we needed to hear. He put it in writing. He recorded it for all time. Listen, if you know the story, he miraculously protected it, preserved it, and he supernaturally had it published in now over 3,000 languages, best-selling book of all time, so you could have it, so you could read it, so it could change your life. And the real difference in life, I mean, if you just look around, you see it. It's the people who have read this thing and are trying to live by it. There's a big difference between them and really everybody else. Amen. You know, most people in this world don't. Here, let me finish Jesus' thought. Here's what he says. Therefore, this is Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation. What series are we in? Foundations. This is what we're talking about. On the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine does not put them into practice. It's like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I have lived at both ends of that truth, and all I'm telling you is build on the rock. Pick up the book and figure out how to live the way God intended. Because it, it will not only change your present life. Listen, it will change your eternal destiny. It'll change, it'll change your present life. It'll change your family. It'll change some of your friends. It'll change the way you do life and see life and see people. It'll change relationships. It'll change emotional health levels. It will change decision making. Desires will change over time as you're rooted in the word. It will ultimately change your destiny. And that's the thing. And because here's the truth, okay? Nobody builds the right life. Nobody builds on the rock by luck. Did you know that? Nobody builds the right life on accident. Like, wow, your life just worked out. What'd you do? I have no idea. I just, I just did everything I felt like doing each day and it just ended up awesome. Now, a lot of people choose that path, but they, when, the, when the winds blow and the streams, that thing falls with a great crash. When we build our lives the way we think, the way we feel, what we think is right, what we want to do, even if it somehow, I will say this, even if it somehow ended up working out in this life, that life has no power in the next. It won't be here. It won't last. It's... What happens, have you, ever built, uh, have you ever built anything, like you get, you order something on Amazon, it comes, order something from Lowe's, it comes, assembly required, right? Assembly is always required, which is weird to me. A sofa, like now we have to build our own sofas. I'm like, am I Amish? What's happening? Okay, beard, I get it. So everything arrives and you got assembly required. I'm like, dang, okay. I, so you, first thing you do, if you're, um, if you're, a uh, guy, the first thing you do is you gather all the parts and the pieces and you start building, right? Now, the first thing you do if you're a lady is you get the instruction manual <laughs> and you open it. And listen, I'm not sexist, but I am going to go on record. It's going to be on the internet. I believe most of the time women do things a lot better than men. They're, they're just a little more methodical. I'm, at least half the audience got to like that one, right? And it's the half I'm most afraid of, so that worked. Okay. <laughs> Women usually try to do things the right way the first time. Guys know better. We know we don't need to because we got it all figured out. And we see parts and pieces and we see a problem. We go, I got this. I got this. And so we just start working. The other day, I was, I, 
I just did this a couple months ago. Hunting camp up in Kentucky with some buddies. We're building tree stands. You know, I'm like, nothing more manly than being in the woods and building tree stands. And the last thing you want to do when you're with your bros in the woods, you ain't reading no directions, right? We're dudes. We got this. And that's not my first tree stand. So we're building tree stands. And we get them all. We're right at that last step. And it's like, okay, what do we do? And we realize that this one bolt has to go in here. But it's the wrong bolt. And because we used the one that was too big for the, in the first step, we use the bolts that are saved for the last step. So you know what we had to do? Tear the whole thing down. Listen to more country music. <laughs> Which I'm already depressed, you know, building the stand. Now I got to go back and start all over. Now I'm really, I've lost dogs. I've lost family. I'm like, geez. <laughs> We were in the backwoods of Kentucky, tearing these things. You know, the only thing worse than building a tree stand is tearing one apart so that you can rebuild it the right way with the instructions. How many of us have done that with our lives? We skip the instructions and we just start living. I got this. I can figure this out. It looks easy to me until all of a sudden it's not, right? You hit that wall. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I say, oh yeah, hold my beer. I got this. I got this. It's almost like a challenge for some of us. Jesus like, apart from me, you can do nothing. We're like, oh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And I, I swear, I look back on my life, and I think I have tried to beat that statement every which way I could, and I found out it doesn't work. He's right. I was wrong. I thought I could until I couldn't. I thought I had until I hadn't. And I, I've tried to do every aspect of my life on my own, only to find out. I go running back to the instruction manual because I messed it up. I'm like, okay, why am I left with this piece trying to make it fit in this? Like, Lord, I thought I could do marriage on my own. Help. <laughs> There's got to be something in here. Right? I thought I could raise kids on my own. Double help. I've got four. I need more Bible. I thought I could do relationships and dating. I thought I could figure out my finances. I thought I could manage my business. I thought I could plan my future. I thought I could make it a day without you, and it didn't work. Sinking sand. A great crash. I've had a couple. I want to tell you today, though, we don't have to live our lives waiting for the next crash. We don't. It feels like for a lot of people, you're just living crash to crash. And even right now, if something is good, you're waiting for the bottom to fall out because you're used to it. He says, I don't want you living like that. You don't have to live a life fearing for the next crash. You can live a weatherproof, stormproof, right? Problem-proof life. Not problem free. I want you to understand if you actually listen to what Jesus said, the problems are coming either way. The exact same ones. He said, the winds are going to blow. The rains are going to come. The streams. Both people are going to experience life in all its fullness. Pastor Daniel said today as he was leading worship, here's a guarantee. In this world, you will have trouble. He promised that. He says, Here, there's a difference, though. The one who builds their life on the rock, that life isn't washing away when all that stuff comes. That life is solid. We got to make a decision. Are we going to build our lives on the rock of his word or on the sand of our feelings and opinions? Jesus, a lot of people had left him because he started really teaching. You know, he wasn't just giving away fish. And he said, are you guys going to leave me too? And Simon Peter and the disciples were like, where else would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You get to this place in life where you know this is true. He's right. He's real, and I'm not going anywhere else. If you, if you want a master class on how to mess up your life, see me after service. I, sign up now. <laughs> I've done it. You know, it's crazy because, I, I mean, most of you know my wife is the pastor's wife, and she's discipled and baptized so many people, and it's like, but you and I could teach a class on how to mess up your life. <laughs> we did it. When we met each other, we were lost. I mean, we had done everything we thought. And listen, it wasn't because we hated God. It's just because we believed we knew best. And we were living not by this, but by this and that what we felt and what we thought. But listen, if you want to build a life that lasts, it's right here. If you want to build a life that reflects the love that God has for you, it's right here. If you want a life that bears fruit, that gives hope, that has wisdom, a life that endures for all eternity. There's only one place to get that life, and it's in him, and it starts right here. And so we're going to close. I want, I want to encourage you to make a decision, though, because I told you about Psalm 119, 
And these different authors compose these different stanzas. Longest chapter of the Bible, and it's a tribute to the Word of God itself. It's really unique. And in, in there, the psalmist, one of them, as they're writing, and they're testifying to the power and the healing and the helpfulness of God's Word, there's this simple commitment, and it says this in Psalm 119, 16, I will not neglect your word. I was meditating on that simple statement, and I realized that commitment could change your life. Anybody who's in Christ is a new creation. This is for everybody. It's, it's accessible to all, but that commitment will change your life. And I'm saying this year, I want that to be my commitment. I was thinking, it says, I will not neglect your word. I can't say I haven't neglected his word. I look back on my life, I think, okay, if, imagine this, if we spent as much time in God's word as we do on Facebook. And I know so much good happens on Facebook. We're able to share our opinions and everybody then agrees with us and we convert them to our political views. It's never happened. All we do is fight and show cat memes. If we spend as much time in God's word as we do on Facebook, Instagram, online, on Amazon, on Netflix, watching the news and regurgitating the same. I'm just saying, man, I will not neglect your word. That is a, that's a pretty cool commitment that I know could change somebody's life. In 2023, that's what I'm like, Lord, I want that new creation flow. I want that next level flow. I want that built on the rock flow for me and mine simple commitment. Here's what we're doing this year too. If you want to join me in this as a church, we're starting this week with the book of James. I, I've learned some things over the years as a pastor. Usually we're like, we're going to read through the Bible this year as a church and two people do it. My wife and one of her friends. And then I have to be guilty all year because she's doing it and I don't make it. So that's a lot. And I don't know that God's asking us to do big things. He's asking us to continue to trust him in small things over time. And we end up in a different place. We're starting with the book of James this week. We're going to read through it. It's one of the most hard-hitting books of the New Testament. And if it doesn't hit you right where you are in the first 10 verses, I'll give you your money back. What are we charging for this? Is it free? Oh, it's free. See, there you go. I mean, God wants to meet you right where you are. He loves you way too much to leave you like that. And I'm just saying the life that he has for you, it starts in here. Get in it. Join us with this commitment this week. I will not neglect your word, because God, I believe it has the power to change my life. Let's pray together. God, thank you today for everyone here. I thank you that you love us right where we are, however we walked in here. What a cool thing. And there's actually nobody at any of our locations watching online at home thinking, man, I've messed up and I don't even know where to start. And you're going, start right here. Start right now. Start with me, and I'm with you. And you don't love me any more than you love that person. Lord, you're with us right now. You accept us as we are, and you're inviting us to be so much more. Thank you. I can testify that that's true. I thank you for all the people that testified today that they've seen the power of your word at work in their lives. And so we give you glory, and in faith, we make a commitment. This year, God, we don't want to neglect your word because we believe it has the power to change our lives. Thank you for making change available. God, thank you for making change accessible. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today for Real Life Online. We hope this experience encouraged you. As part of our Real Life family, we want you to know that we are here for you. And if you need prayer or you'd like to get connected to any of the resources we mentioned, you can find it all at real.life slash connect. And if you'd like to stay up to date with what God is doing here at Real Life and always want to know when we go live, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find links to our website and other real life resources that are available for you in the description area below. Thanks for spending part of your day with us. We want you to know that God loves you. We love you and we'll see you next time.